little bit about reading philosophy. Reading philosophy is probably very unlike most anything you've read thus far. Uh, it's not like reading fiction, right? When you're reading fiction, especially popular fiction, uh, you're reading the text and it's kind of producing this little movie in your head and uh, you're affected by your emotions, right? Reading fiction is much more passive than reading nonfiction. Nonfiction, at least a good chunk of it, is not supposed to be entertaining, right? It's not supposed to produce a movie in your head and your emotions affect you. Uh, reading nonfiction should be much more active, right? Emotions are passive, right? Your, your emotions affect you. You really can't stop it in a lot of ways. Um, your intellect, though, has to be active. It is a product of your decisions and you using your mind. Right? So reading nonfiction is going to be much more, frankly, exhausting. Uh, a lot of nonfiction is, in some ways, I want to say, I don't want to say straightforward, but uh, not as complicated sometimes as reading philosophy. Um, you know, reading philosophy tends to be much more complicated because the philosopher looks at both sides of the argument, or at least should, okay? or frequently. We're not used to this. It's just not often that we're talking with somebody and they're trying to persuade you of some belief or another, and and they say, but but I could be completely wrong about this. Let's look at reasons to the contrary. No, no. Usually when they're trying to persuade you, they're just presenting one side of the debate. Uh, philosophers tend to look at both sides. Uh, you are supposed, in fact, <laughs> I've had students who've been so confused as to what the philosopher is doing, they thought the philosopher was arguing for the contradictory position that they were actually arguing for. Um, you know, for better or for worse, philosophers are very good at looking at both sides of the argument. So sometimes this can be a little confusing. So uh, philosophy, reading philosophy will be demanding. You're going to have to use your intellect. You're going to, if, you are going to have to take the words and comprehend them and figure out the implications. They're not going to be spelled out for you. You have to figure out what's going on with the text. The author is not going to tell you what's going on in the text. You don't need to know what's going on with the text with fiction, right? You, you know that fiction is supposed to be telling you a story. It's supposed to be entertaining. That's not a whole lot to figure out. With philosophy, philosopher is undoubtedly going to argue for a position that you think is nonsense, or sometimes you think it's dead on right. But when you get to the reasons against or a full examination of the evidence, that's when you can kind of get lost, right? The philosopher isn't going to say, well, let's take a look at this to see if maybe I'm mistaken here. No. Um, or, you know, not going to explain that part to you. It's just going to do it. <laughs> so reading philosophy is going to be much more difficult than what you've dealt with so far. What you've dealt with so far. Okay. That's the bad news. The good news is I'm going to give you some conceptual tools on navigating through that piece of philosophy. Now, to do this, um, I'm adapting some of the skills and topics from Warner Adler's How to Read a Book, applying it specifically to philosophy. And what we're what you're going to do, right, when you're reading philosophy, uh, is you're going to skim. Skimming is not speed reading. Skimming is selective reading. While you skim, you're looking for answers to a particular questions. So it's not just any question you can think of at the top of your head. That's not always going to be helpful. You are going to be looking for the question the philosopher is trying to answer. What the philosopher believes answers that question. What the terms are, the concepts that the philosopher uses to reach that answer. The assertions or the evidence, the presumed truths that the philosopher believes, not only does the philosopher believe are true, but will uh, lead to that answer. The inference, how those assertions fit together, how they're related to each other, to infer that answer. A philosopher will also look at objections, either anticipating what other people are going to say as a counter-argument to the philosopher's own position, or what some others have, in fact, said. And the rebuttals. And the rebuttal is how the ph uh, philosopher dismantles that counter-argument. The objections and rebuttals don't always happen, but... You know, because we're dealing with excerpts, they don't they don't always happen, but they, they happen with enough frequency that we should we should address them. So when you're reading, right, we are going to make a map, so to speak. We're going to make a map to guide our way, to navigate our way through this complicated, dense, boring. I hate this reading. Reading. <laughs> the other questions 
uh, you're identifying the question, the answer, the terms, the assertions, the inference, the objections or rebuttals. Is gonna, gonna, by identifying those, we're gonna be able to navigate through this piece of reading. And I really wanna say, because I've, you know, I've done this myself, right? This benefited myself in my own studies in philosophy. The skills that I picked up in reading comprehension for philosophy have pretty much applied to everything else. Pretty much applied to everything else. So questions, answers, terms, assertions, inference, objections, rebuttals. So I've said that we're skimming, that you're skimming while you're reading and you're trying to answer specific questions. I also just asked, what are the basic questions? And if you came up with a blank, who, what, where, when, why, how? Right, those are the basic questions. And when you're skimming with any given piece of text, right? if you don't have any idea how to ask specific questions within a discipline, start with those, like who, what, why, when, who, what, where, when, why, how? Right, those are the basic questions. Okay. <sighs> so what are we going to answer in philosophy? Right, when we're reading in philosophy, right? uh, you are first, or one of the big things to look for here is the question and the answer. When we're, uh, when we're reading philosophy, right? Every last human endeavor, whenever somebody is creating anything, be it a chapter in a book, a paper, a commercial, um, a piece of music, a movie, uh, you know, a flyer, a piece of artwork, uh, whatever it is, right? There's a purpose. There's a reason why the human being is creating that. I, I, I struggle to think of a situation where somebody is creating without reason. I'm not saying it's impossible. But it's certainly not frequent. It's certainly not our favorite <laughs> form of creation. We think that's kind of silly to do that, right? <laughs> but um, there's always some kind of purpose. There's always some reason why uh, that person is creating or doing that thing. So with philosophy, I, I think the best way to understand that purpose is to is the question and the answer. The question is what the philosopher is the question the philosopher is trying to answer, and the answer is what the philosopher believes answers that question. Uh, it is possible to ask a question and to provide a response, but it's not actually an answer to the question. Uh, if you've listened to any political de uh, debates for any length of time, you realized that candidates do this. The moderator will ask a question, the candidate will respond, say something very nice, very, you know, makes you happy and proud or excites your emotions, but doesn't actually ever answer the question. It's entirely possible to respond to a question, not answer it. You can ask me, I don't know, um, what's my favorite color? And I tell you, uh, I had uh, beans and rice for dinner. Doesn't answer the question. Right? So, and I'm not gonna promise you the philosophers are always great at, at sticking to the, or at, definitely answer their question. That's something you need to look out for. Uh, but you should, at, should I try to identify the question the philosopher's trying to answer and what the philosopher believes answers that question. I, and if you're anything about this, is that philosophers or anybody ever rarely explicitly states the question they're trying to answer. So you have to comprehend to figure out what the philosopher is doing, right, in order to determine that. So unfortunately, there's no mechanical way, cut and paste way to, to do this. Uh, it just takes a lot of practice. A lot of trial and error, a lot more error than trial. <laughs> Okay, so what is this supposed to do first? Well, you know, I said that reading philosophy can be complicated. You can get lost in the text. We confuse the words for the trees, and or we confuse the words for the forest, right? <laughs> Have you ever heard that phrase? Confusing the can't see the can't see the trees for the forest, right? Meaning that the forest is so overwhelming, you get so lost, and you can't even see the trees anymore. And sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees, right? Because you're paying so much attention to the trees, you've missed the rest of the forest. So what this, what identifying the question and answer will do for us, help us guide our way through this forest, through the thick of the text, by telling us the direction and the destination. So the question should be an, in, it should work like a compass when you're walking in the woods, it should work like a compass, like, okay, I know I need to head that way. Right? That's what the question is supposed to tell you. So if the question is something like, um, What's the relationship between parts and holes, right? So you're sitting, at your, maybe you're sitting in a chair right now. There's different parts of the chair, the legs, the seat, the back, right? And the whole thing is the chair. What we're trying to answer that, you know, maybe the question is that, uh, you know, what's the relationship between parts and whole? 
All right, that's the question, right? That tells us the direction. And uh, the answer is what the philosopher believes answers that question. That's like the destination. That's the, so if we say something like, um, you know, dealing with the, the relationship between parts and wholes, we'll say, well, the parts uh, combine to make the whole, right? So combination or composition, right? That would be the relationship between parts and whole. Okay. So the question is what the philosopher, is what, what, the, what the question of the philosopher is trying to answer. It's our direction. And the answer is the destination. Now, if you've ever been walking in the woods, you realize that's not enough. <laughs> if you've ever been in you know, a trail, or if you've been to one of our state parks, you've seen some of the videos, you know I'm a fan of, uh, of parks. Knowing the direction, knowing the destination is not enough. We're going to need a lot more to get through that. Thick. It's not just a straight line, right? We're going to need a lot more to get through that thicket of the forest to reach our destination. And that's where the rest of the questions we're trying to answer help us. So we're skimming to find the question and the answer. The question will be our direction, the answer is our destination. By the way, did you figure out the question and the answer for this video? Hmm. That might be something helpful to write down in your notes. What's the question I'm trying to answer? And what is, what is it that I think answers the question? Okay, <clears throat> so next step is terms. Terms are the concepts, the meanings, the definitions, the essences that the philosopher is using to reach that answer, to reach that destination. Uh, we could think of it, to use our analogy, right, a walk into the woods, we could think of them as landmarks, right? So we have our direction, right? Our question tells us the direction that we're headed. We're not work, we're going to answer the question, you know, what's the relationship between parts and wholes, all right? And that gives us our direction. We're not worrying. We're not worrying about how to make parts and wholes. We're not worried about how do I know what's a part and what's a whole, right? I'm just... What's the relationship between parts and wholes? And say that my answer is uh, that parts compose the whole. Okay, parts compose the whole, all right. So uh, terms are the landmarks, right? We got our question, we got, we got our destination. So we got our direction, we got our destination, we got our question, we got our answer. Land, we're not gonna travel just in a straight line right over there, right? We are going to use landmarks to get there, right? So uh, in case you didn't, you know, spot this right right away. Uh, the question and the answer that you know, the sample question and the answer that I just gave you is, is a source of terms. So there's there's some terms right there: part, whole, com um, and composition or composes. Those are terms. Terms in and of themselves aren't true or false, right? They just um, define the thing. Okay. So, so there's a number of different ways to define. There's at least nine different ways. You probably can't use all at once. You can define by example, right? So suppose on defining spoon, I might go into my kitchen and start pulling spoons out of the drawer and holding them. I say, say, this is a spoon, right? This is a spoon. Um, that would be an example uh, just to help you. Get, oh, here, you know, there's one here. Let me show you. Spoon. <laughs> That would be a definition or a definition by example, or what's called extension, extension, pointing to particular cases, defining by example. Uh, you can define by intention. This is where you're using actual meaning. So uh, suppose I am, maybe I'll provide a synonym, right? Synonyms can be helpful. They're not always precise or, you know, exact, but they help you get in the ballpark. So spoon, um, I might say a scoop. Right? Scoop. It's kind of like a spoon. That's sort of what a spoon is. It's not exactly the same, but it's kind of like a spoon. Um, I could define by uh, what's called defining by negation, which isn't exactly defining, but it's you know saying what the thing is not, right? Telling me what it's not the same, not the same thing as telling me what it is. But sometimes it can be helpful, especially to what we might what we might call specious similar cases or easily confused cases. So you say, well, I'll talk about spoon. I don't mean uh, laying down with somebody else and holding them in your arms, right? Not, not that kind of spoon. I'm talking about uh, this other kind of spoon, right? So defining by negation, again, not defining, <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, helping to uh, remove confused cases, confused cases. We can also define by uh, what's called operation or, or uh, if we're actually using the thing, how do we know it's a spoon? So, but, you know, a spoon is what you use while you're cooking, right? When you look, when you scoop soup up using that utensil, that's a spoon, right? That's what you're doing. Okay. 
lots of different ways to define. Uh, I'm not going to do it all here in this video. I've given you um, written material you can read, and we'll see plenty of the cases in, in when we're reading for reading these pieces of philosophy. Uh, so when you're skimming, identify those terms. And then when you identify them, write them down. How does the philosopher identify them? How does the philosopher define them? What are the cases? What is the meaning? What are the confused cases? What's the, you know, how, by negation? How is the philosopher defining those terms? Write it down, right? Write it down. These are our landmarks. They tell us how we're going to uh, get there. When you're reading, when you're skimming, Start linking up and start figuring out what, how these terms linked up. All right, so we got parts, holes, uh, and we've got uh, combination or composition. Start identifying those in the text. And what are the terms that's, that link those together, right? How are those terms linked together? Finding more terms. Finding more terms. Okay. So uh, when we're skimming, we're identifying the question, we're identifying the answer, we're identifying terms. Right? This is help. This, we're building this map now. We're building our map of this piece of philosophy. We're skimming, we're finding these pieces. Well, there's still more to answer. There's still more to answer. So we talk about skimming, trying to find the question, the answer, and the terms. Next is the assertions. The assertions are the presumed truths, the evidence that the philosopher is using to reach the answer. Terms are, are not assertions. Strictly speaking, they're not really true or false, or either accurate or inaccurate, right? So, I, you know, I can, I can do this, this is a spoon. And, you know, in some sort of way, that's true, right? A hold up, say this is a spoon, that's true. But that doesn't really yet tell us what a spoon is, right? It doesn't tell we fully define <laughs> that we are very, very precise. We got a very precise definition, we got a very precise meaning. But that in itself just really isn't a, a piece of evidence, right? It isn't until you combine terms that you get uh, a sentence that's either true or false. You get a subject and a predicate. Right? You get a subject and a predicate. So these are the assertions, right? This is what we're looking for with the assertions. This is what's true or what's false, really what's true, <laughs> that is going to lead us to that uh, answer, right? Now, when I say presumed truths, because we're really not arguing whether the evidence is true or false, right? That's if you try to argue uh, or try to prove that every piece of that piece of evidence is true, well, then you have to prove that the evidence that you offer for that proof is true. Then you have to prove that the offer the evidence that you offer for that proof is true. Then you have to prove that the evidence that you offer. Oh, it's, I'm already tired. <laughs> so you can't prove everything. Uh, you start with some presumed truth, some some starting evidence. Okay. Well, these are the assertions. Right? These are the assertions. Now, I said that the terms are the landmarks. Well, how those landmarks come together, that's the trail, right? The landmarks help you find the trail. Well, these are the assertions. Right? Assertions are composed of terms. Right? Your declarative sentence has a subject and a predicate. Those are going to be the terms. How those are related to each other determines what sort of assertion you have. It might be just... Um, you know, diving a little bit into logic here, what we call the categorical imperative. All dogs are mammals, right? Dog is one term, mammal is another. We got the all and the is, okay. And how that comes together, that gives us something that's true or false. In that case, it's true, right? All dogs are mammals. Um, the contrapositive of that, all mammals are dogs. Well, that's false, right? Because plenty of mammals that are not dogs. So the assertions are the presumed truths. When you start following those assertions, you see how they... Uh, you know, how they're supposed to lead us to that uh, answer, try to lead us to that destination. That's another way that we start navigating through this piece of philosophy. When you identify assertion, just like when you identify a term, when you identify a term, you find the definition, write it down. It's like term. <laughs> and it's the same thing with assertions. This is an assertion. Write it down. Right? Write it down. Uh, now we're getting closer to understanding what the philosopher is doing in any particular piece of philosophy. We've got the question, which tells us where we're headed. We've got the destination. We've got the answer that the philosopher thinks answers that question. We've got the terms. These are the landmarks that are leading us to that answer. We've got the assertions. These are the trails that we're walking along to get to that uh, answer. Right? And the, the, what gives us the trail are these landmarks, right? The landmarks, these terms tell us what trail we're on. 
And hopefully, the thought is that better be, <laughs> those assertions are leading to that answer, leading to that destination. Well, if you've ever been walking in the woods, you know that not just any trail gets you to your destination. <laughs> not just any assertion gets you to your answer. Uh, and even just a collection of assertions don't necessarily lead to that answer. You can say a whole bunch of true things and not prove anything, right? Um, the sky is blue. I've got over 10 cups in my cabinet and my dog is a mammal. That doesn't prove much of anything. Not a whole lot. All those are true, but they don't prove anything. The inference is how those assertions are related to each other to infer that answer. Sometimes it's called the argument. Uh, we can think of this as the connections, how the trails are connected to each other to reach that destination. They have to be related in a particular way to reach that destination. Now, there's lots of ways for assertions to be related to each other to make an inference. <laughs> we are not going to cover all. We're not going to cover some of them. <laughs> we just can't. There's a whole nother course for that. It's called Philosophy 23 or 3, that uh, introduction to logic, which is supposed to, it's supposed to answer this question of well, you know, what's a good inference. So, uh, you know, that's the bad news. The good news is, is that you don't really have to be competent in logic in order to figure that out. I'll, I'll tell you in the videos, I'll tell you uh, how, that's, how those are supposed to be related to each other to, to infer that answer. Um, but, you know, look, look at what we have now. We have the question, which is the direction that we're headed. We have the answer, which is the destination. We have the terms, which are the landmarks to reach that destination. We have the trails, how those landmarks are related to we uh, come together. Right? We're walking along that trail to reach that destination. We have the inference, how those trails are connected to each other to reach that destination. Right? When we figure all that out, then we will have a much better idea of what the philosopher is doing. You should write these down, right? Whenever you write down these assertions, identify what the assertions are and what they're inferring. Because the chances are there's going to be lots of inferences along the way. Yeah, there's going to be little steps along the way. Right. So yeah, when you are writing, when you're reading a, a philosophy and you're writing down the terms and the assertions, find the inference. What are these, what are these assertions supposed to prove? Identify what is inferred and identify from what it's inferred. Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to say that, we're, that once we identify that, we're all done. But no, no. We still have more to do when we're reading philosophy. For better or for worse, hardly any piece of philosophy is just as cut and dry as what I just identified. Sometimes authors, what be it philosophy or anything else, sometimes authors go on tangents. They start talking about something that's maybe interesting, just sort of, sort of related, or they're trying to you know, say, no, we're not going to do this. These are all changes. They're not going directly for the destination. They're, they're sightseeing. <laughs> I'm going to go look at this other landmark for a little while. Or I'm going to follow this trail to see where it goes. There's all kinds of ways you can get distracted from the destination. Right? Well, two main ways that this happens in philosophy are objections and rebuttals. So I said that students, with some regularity, some frequency, get confused while they're reading philosophy. They, they lose track of what the philosopher is actually trying to argue. And one of the reasons is that philosophers, uh, you know, it's considered a virtue in philosophy to uh, look at all sides of the argument, and specifically objections. And these are anticipated counterarguments, right? Or anticipated arguments uh, to show that the preferred answer is false. It can happen in a lot of different ways. Objections will uh, say that, you know, an objection might be that the, the terms that the philosopher uses are either imprecise or ambiguous, or maybe they're, you know, they've committed some other area in terms of defining, right? That roughly that the terms, uh, the terms are inaccurate. Uh, they, that could be that the assertions are actually false. Right, you take one of the assertions, like, oh, no, this, this one here, this third assertion right here, it's actually false, and I'll show you why. Right? Or uh, that the argument is, uh, that the inference is somehow uh, not a good inference. Right? Maybe there's a formal fallacy in some way, shape, or form. Right? Uh, or even just like, taking the conclusion that the philosopher is offering and, and give some absurd consequence for it. Right? These are all examples of objections. 
And philosophers, or it's considered a virtue in philosophy to try to anticipate all, you know, the best or most damaging objection, <laughs> all right? And so, you know, sometimes it's what the philosopher, the author actually anticipates or what somebody else has already given. Philosophy doesn't always happen in a vacuum. Sometimes it does. Somebody, sometimes somebody's just sitting around and thinking off the top of their head and boom, they start writing down. But usually this happens in kind of like a conversation. Uh, a philosopher is replying to what somebody said earlier and then the next philosopher is replying to what that second one said. It can, it can be a very, very long, conver I don't want to say conversation, but it can be a very, very long uh, chain. Um, and when a philosopher is writing, right, very, happens with some regularity, they will anticipate these objections. So you ought to write that down, right? The philosopher anticipates or you know, gives us this objection and you know, state what the objection is. Is it an objection about a term? Is it an objection about a, an assertion, the inference, or even just the answer itself, right? Is it had some sort of absurd consequence? Uh, this is not taking us directly to our destination, right? This is a little bit of our tangent. <laughs> uh, but to carry out our analogy, uh, th these objections are how we're derailed from reaching that answer, right? We're taken off the track. We've got the wrong term. We've got all kinds of things. Uh, when you find the objection, again, write it down. Write it down. Identify it, write it down. Um, and what's gonna help you, you know, figure out what's, what's an objection versus say part of the argument is if it's actually contrary to the, to the answer. <laughs> um, Again, sometimes people get confused, but if it's not leading to that destination, right, um, then it, it might be an objection. So we are skimming to find the question, the answer, the terms, the assertions, the inference, and now the objection. Well, what are we supposed to do with that? So we're almost done. So far, we have our question, the direction we're headed, the answer, the destination, the terms, which are the landmarks, the um, uh, 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 assertions, which are the trails, the inferences, how those trails are connected to each other to finally reach that destination. We have also had to deal with, you know, getting distracted, right? When are we going to, uh, when are we distracted from our task? Uh, trying to find the objections, right? How other so counter arguments for the philosopher's preferred uh, answer. And uh, well, how is the philosopher going to handle those objections? That's the rebuttal. Right? It'd be really weird for a philosopher to say, yes, this sh clearly shows that one of my assertions is false, but I'm going to stick to my answer anyway. No, nah, that's just weird. <laughs> so um, the, uh, uh, the rebuttals are how the philosopher handles those objections. How, how, does, how does the philosopher handle those objections? It can be in a, a wide variety of ways. It depends on what the objection is. If the objection claims that somehow one of the terms is inaccurate, the philosopher will you know, maybe tighten up the term or say, no, no, this is, the, this is the accepted way to define this term. If the claim is that one of the assertions are false, the philosopher tries to defend the assertion, maybe providing more evidence for it. It could be a number of different things. Um, so when you are writing this down, right, and keeping those notes, you need to identify the rebuttals and you need to identify what objection that rebuttal is rebutting. Say that too many times fast. When you figured all this out, when we're writing, we're figuring this all out, again, using skimming, then we'll be able to navigate our way through this forest of our piece of philosophy and, uh, Finally figure out what that philosopher is saying. We won't get lost nearly so easily. I started off by saying that reading philosophy is not like reading fiction because there's a lot more to do, right? It's much more active. Fiction does something to you. Well, this is what I'm talking about. You're going to have to use your intellect. You're going to have to comprehend when we have a question and answer a term, an assertion, an inference, an objection, a rebuttal. Not going to just magically leap off the page. You're going to have to dive into the text to figure it out. You're going to figure out what how one piece of the text is related to the other and the different pieces of the text. And these concepts, the question, the answer, the term, the assertions, the inference, the objection, the rebuttal, that's the way to do it. Good luck.